I'm happy to be here, of course, um, not least to foster the collaboration. So when I was approached, um, uh, yeah, I couldn't say no. <laughs> I could really not say no. Um, you raised the uh, um, expectation quite a bit, and I hope that at the end of the day, which is a tough day for all of us, including myself, uh, we can still live up to these expectations. So initially when I was invited, I was thinking, what um, should I present at... Uh, the CZEP conference, and I was a bit unsecure. Remember my first reply to your email? And then, you know, I was saying I cannot do it in the morning, and, but also in terms of topics. But then I quickly realized that um, this topic would uh, fit um, perfectly because um, CZEP is about um, social e and uh, economic behavior. That's in the title. And preferences are key determinants of social and economic behavior. And that's actually what I want to talk about before I start. Let me give a very, very brief history. Um, I think it's always important to put into, say, historical context what we do. Because oftentimes, you know, what we do has a past and, you know, decides, you know, about the next steps and so on. So, um, this research project that I present today um, actually um, was born when we, you know, somehow by coincidence were approached by people from the German Socioeconomic Panel Study to run experiments there. And then we said, um, we at the time were um, very interested in measuring preferences, particularly at the time there was an interest in documenting heterogeneity preferences, and basically saying something about what is the representative agent, I've never met him, you probably also, that was kind of the, the, the uh, kind of um, the setting um, that we started this all in. And then, of course, he said, let's measure individual decision making. That's easy to measure in a, um, in a survey like the German Social Economic Panel Study. So we proposed to measure time and risk preference. And then they said, look, this is awesome because we have just developed a survey module to measure risk preference. And so um, our names are much connected to this general risk question. We have never invented it. Okay, we have never invented that question. In fact, when we saw the question, we were pretty skeptical whether that would measure anything um, that we as economists are interested in. Okay? And, I mean, it's not that we were um, not believing that we could capture something about, um, you know, risk preference by asking people what they think, how they would behave. But we were skeptical. So then the first step is we, we just asked a question in a laboratory context when we were just having you know, people engaging in lottery choice tasks. And we saw that there was a significant correlation between the answers to that question and also the lottery choice. Then we thought, okay, to really convince people, let's then run you know, a field experiment, you could say, um, in which people representatively sample from the German population, engage in a lottery task that has relatively high stakes, and also answer the question. And then we saw that there was a correlation between behavior in the lottery task and the question. And then, of course, we were really excited because now we could measure with a very simple question something that captures risk preference in the way that e economists would conceptualize it. Okay, so if you are living in expected utility framework, it's a concavity of utility, lot which is an obvious candidate, and so on. So the, I will not say much about this today. And so we detected there's a huge power, and people um, seem to have a good notion of what their preferences are. So at that point, we, we basically decided that it would be great to measure preferences in all these other domains in a similar way. Of course, what we did at that time is um, we ex post validated a question that came to us ad hoc, okay? But we thought, okay, maybe it's a nice idea to develop survey items that are, you know, the best among a set of survey items and that measure something of the preference that we want to capture. That was actually the birth of that project. Um, so how old this project is you can, and how long it took us, to be frank, and may, we are probably very slow, um, can be seen by the fact that um, the first thought about this was in 2006, now it's published 12 years later. Um, Anke came on board as a PhD student when we were basically developing um, the module, so when we were running experiments in a lab in which we um, tried to elicit um, preferences by standard um, incentivized choice experiments.
And then um, Benny came in um, even uh, one or two years later when the data was already there. That was in um, beginning of 2013. And now uh, Anke and Benny, they moved on. So they are not PhDs anymore. They are now at Harvard and they are married. Okay? <laughs> so I'm not sure whether there's a causality here <laughs> and whether that's connected to the project, um, but that's the story. So why did I say that? Um, because it puts a bit into perspective what we do. Okay? So the aim was never to uh, measure all nuances of, say, risk uh, preferences, of time preference, that's very involved, right? And if you look at history, we as uh, economists like to uh, have simple models in which we conceptualize preference as in, in a unidimensional uh, way. And we have one preference parameter, say, for discounting. Now, we can argue for hours whether that makes sense, and we all know that it doesn't because it's a simplification of the world, okay? But we nevertheless want to just live in that world for a second where we have one measure. We call it, say, patience. Okay? And we have one measure for risk preference, which we call risk preference. Okay? Factually, there is actually uh, more to say, which, but I, I don't want to get into much detail on this. Um, you could have an argument whether we really have preference parameters here, which I would say no, we don't. We just have measures of preferences, okay? of preference parameters maybe. And what we have is basically risk-taking behavior, patient behavior. That's kind of what we measure. And to the extent that you can infer from this, um, people's preferences, I can live with the interpretation that we really measure preferences. But I just want to say that to um, probably avoid a lot of um, questions later on. All right. Okay. So now, as I started out um, referring to CZEP, um, it is clear that in many theories, and not only in economics, but also in psychology and neighboring disciplines, um, we believe that behavior is shaped by um, a set of um, you know, determinants and preferences is one of them. And what we were looking at are preferences that um, shape many, many um, decisions. Why? Because many decisions have an element of riskiness, of intertemporal choice, and of social interaction. So that's actually why we looked at um, risk preference, time preference, social preference. By the way, uh, Oliver said that uh, we worked a lot on risk preference. That's, that's correct. That's not because we weren't interested in these other things. but. That's just what may way more complicated, right? So risk preference you can elicit by individual decision making. Time preference already involves a time do, you know, domain, another dimension. And social preference is probably you know, the most difficult one because it also has a third dimension, namely social interaction, right? So, but now we look at all three of them. Okay, so there's also a large empirical literature to which many people have contributed that basically documents that there's a lot of heterogeneity in these preferences and also that um, these preferences are predictive of some kind of behaviors. All right? Okay. So, but until recently, less was actually known about how that looks around the globe. So much of the evidence was, say, for Western European countries, predominantly Germany, Denmark, when we think about risk preference and the U.S. say. Yeah. And so we never knew how general all these insights were. So that's one, one big motivation to really look into that. The other motivation, of course, is can we explain differences in country level outcomes by differences in preference endowments? Another big question is where do these differences come from and so on. So a couple of uh, questions that were open until now. So for instance, the first one, obvious one is do uh, countries really differ in their preference endowments, right? And then the next one is, how large is this variation? You could also ask, if there's variation across country, is the um, cross-country variation larger than the within-country variation? Also a very in interesting question, yeah? So if we would sample some person, you know, from the global population, is that person more different um, to me, or much more different to me than somebody I sample from the same country? Right, that's also an interesting question. So, are certain preferences correlated? Now, we, we already know a bit about this yeah, from existing studies when we measure um, preferences. But we were also interested whether that leads over long periods of time to preference bundles. Okay? Um, I will not say much about this today. That's probably more future work. So, do preferences um, vary um, um, at the individual level? And we know this, that they do vary, of course. But do we have 
are there systematic determinants that explain the variation? Now, people have, for instance, uh, including ourselves, have um, postulated that women are less willing to take risks than men, for instance. Is that globally true? We don't know. You know does that depend on culture, or is that some other thing? All right, so next um, set of questions we could ask is um, kind of related to the question where do preferences come from? So are they in some sense related to culture, to religion, to language, yeah? or to geography? And um, many economists would agree that a key question is really do these preferences then um, explain differences in economic outcomes across countries? Okay. All right. So, of course, when you want to answer these questions, then what you need is data on preferences. Ideally, among representative samples in every country, across different countries, of course. And ideally, these uh, measures are measured in a comparable way, standardized way across these countries. Ah, it's pretty tough to get. So we worked a bit on that. So the first step in that endeavor was developing a survey module that could be easily applied to surveys in many countries. It used kind of the same wording, of course, translated in different, to different languages. And um, ideally survey items that we can be sure um, are related to the concepts that we want to measure. All right. So I tell you during the talk maybe very briefly how we did this. I will not spend most of the time talking about the details of that process, how we develop it. So for today, you can always ask questions, by the way. Yeah. Um, I will be pretty silent on that. And um, then eventually, we had this preference module. Um, we got Gallup on board. There was a tender. Gallup had the best deal. They offered us to do it in 75 countries. We had to, could choose um, which countries from a list of, I think, 126 countries they were serving in that year, we would want to um, basically survey with our preference module. That was the amount of money that we had at our, at our disposal. And then in the process, they made a mistake. And so they said, look, um, you get, you know, there was one country they had promised us and they wouldn't survey it. And then they said, look, you get two. That's why we have that weird number of 76. Okay, that explains that. Okay. Okay, so I was already alluding to this. So we had a, uh, um, a list of countries. And so we had to make choices. And in, in that process, we tried to um, pick countries such that they are representative um, of um, geography, so that we basically cover all continents, um, all cultures, and so on. So sometimes we had to make trade offs. So one trade off was, you know, couldn't choose all European countries. Um, so there was um, Belgium, France, and uh, the Netherlands on the list. So then we decided eventually not to survey Belgium, yeah, because we saw culturally it's either in French part or the Dutch part. <laughs> now, if you would tell Belgians, then they would probably disagree, but OK, fine. And similar things in Scandinavia and so on. Now, we um, basically took um, all countries um, that were um, available in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's still underrepresented. You see that. Right. OK, so that explains a bit about the data. The data are now publicly available. This is the web page. You can also go to the um, publication now. And it's also cited there. Or you just Google global preferences. I just learned the other day that you can always Google it. OK? So all right, good. So, so what I will do today, um, briefly, I will show you um, a first set of results, how fundamental um, our economic preferences are distributed across the world, say a bit about heterogeneity, identify ge um, geographic and cultural patterns. And then we say a bit about um, relationships to individual characteristics. Um, and we, we relate these preference measures then to individual outcomes and country level outcomes. So this is the outline of the talk. Um, before I get to the distribution of preferences across the world, I just want to um, say a few words about the data set. Okay. So as I already alluded, said, um, the data was collected um, by Gallup within the framework of the Gallup uh, world poll. So Gallup service um, 
a set of countries that's also on a slightly on a rotating basis, not always the same countries every year. So they, they survey um, countries across the globe and um, they ask questions about political attitudes, but also, the, um, of course, demographics and so on. In some sense, it's a bit comparable to the World Value Survey, but um, they have less on um, attitudes and preferences, of course. Okay. Um, so we basically um, then um, introduce our preference module into 76 of these surveys, and the median sample size was 1,000. Keep that in mind. So um, we oversampled just a small set of countries. Okay, so China, Russia, Iran, I think. Um, they had uh, 1,500 or 2,500. And then two countries, Haiti and Suriname, where we only sampled 500. No? Otherwise, we would have covered the entire island. <laughs> and um, anyhow, um, but of course, that means that in large countries, right? We are not as representative as in smaller countries. And our data set is, is strictly not representative of the world population, right? For that, we would have to weigh. So what I show you today, we don't do that weighting, OK? And, and of course, it's also true that in, in China, we probably had to, we should have sampled, you know, ideally 10,000 people to also say something about region variation in China. Yeah? So region variation in China does exist, but it's now based on pretty small samples within the regions, right? Okay. Good. So, um, importantly, um, these uh, measures, um, I introduced them on the, on the first slide actually. So, we measure willingness to take risk, patients, positive and negative reciprocity, altruism, and trust. Um, they were created in the following way. In a nutshell, what we did is we invited students in Bonn to the lab. They did a choice experiment, say, on, they did a lottery choice experiment to elicit their risk preference. In a different week, they came back to the lab and then they answered a set of survey questions on risk preference. So things that other people have proposed would measure risk preference. So including our general risk question. And then we also made up a few questions, all right? So that we thought were plausible. Oftentimes inspired by the way that psychologists ask about these things. Um, and in the next step, then we, we, used, we looked at um, the set of survey questions that best explains behavior in a choice experiment. So in some sense, we take the behavior in a choice experiment as the true measure of preference. We can you know, debate this, of course. Right? So people also took part in um, at least two choice experiments to reduce measurement error in that choice. Right? So we average across these choices. And so what we essentially then do is, cross, um, is, is best subset selection. Um, and for a set of preference, for four of them, we actually have um, an independent sample where we basically check the predictive power of our module. And that's basically also part of the, model, uh, the module selection process. Yeah? So you can envisage the, um, the endeavor as, as follows. You um, first see which kind of combination of survey items best explains the data. Yeah. Then you have a few competing models, sometimes including two items, sometimes three. Yeah. The rest you can already kick out by some criteria, model selection criteria, we, we use BIG, so Bayesian information criterion. And then um, we basically predicted using this model behavior in another sample. And it turned out that for all preference domain, a two item module um, was the best. We never, we never really manipulated this. Okay? So that's just an outcome of the process. And it also turns out that, um, maybe I'll show you here, that in each of these domains, we typically have um, what we call a quantitative question, which is really almost mimicking um, the choice experiment that we had. Yeah? So this is really a hypothetical intertemporal trade-off. Yeah? So basically here in, in Germany it was like the trade-off between uh, getting 100 euro now or a larger amount in a year from now. All right. For risk-taking, we basically uh, also have a quantitative measure. That's a lottery choice measure. 
And we have a, quant a qualitative measure, a self-assessment measure. This turned out to be the general risk question. And again, we did not manipulate it. The data, you can check it, okay? So no manipulation analysis, are just an outcome of the process. So in the end, that means uh, much of the previous stuff that we have done based on the general risk question was not so ba bad because the measure was not so bad in the end. All right. And you see, if you look across all these domain, preference domains, you see that there's typically a self-assessment question and a, you know, kind of hypothetical choice question. And um, what, what I have here as weights is typically, you know, both um, measures get half the weight. Where, how do we get the weights? So what we do is we basically standardize um, the experimental measure in our sample, yeah, and regress that as on the standardized measures of these survey items, you could view this as beta coefficients from a regression, right? Now, so why is that useful for you? If you would run a survey, you could say, give both measures, standardize the measures, give them equal weight, add them up, then you have a measure of, you know, the preference. Question? No? Okay, good. All right, so let me go back. So all what I just described, that was basically, um, done in uh, 2010, and it's in this paper now. And um, for those who are very interested in that, they um, can basically look later on the web and read this. Okay, I'm not going through this again, I've said that. Okay, so that's the best subset selection criteria. All right, so the next step is now um, very um, important. So we took that I, uh, survey module, there's much to criticize, okay? There's much to criticize about this step. So ideally, of course, we would have taken that module, go out to representative samples across the globe, yeah, and redo the analysis. But we ran out of time and money. But luckily, we already had a lot of evidence from our own work and from other people's work, not for all domains, but for instance, for risk, we uh, had a lot of knowledge about, say, how the representative population in lottery choice differs from student populations. We knew what the correlation between our general risk question and the lottery choice is in a student population, bond student, and the um, German population. It's different. So we were kind of um, convinced that we could skip that step. There's also now um, Ferdinand Vieira and his team, they have um, gone out to many countries across the world and have also documented that the general risk question, for instance, is correlated to actual lottery choice behavior in many, many countries. Okay, so it's not to say that this is the end of science, okay? So you can still improve on it. And I invite everyone to do it, okay? But we have to start somewhere. And so this is an, view it as an intermediate result. All right. So what did we do? We took the preference module and then um, we did one step before we took it to the translator. That was we decided that some of these items that I had on, that came out from that procedure here were a bit too complicated uh, to ask on a telephone survey, for instance. So one of the items that comes out here is a hypothetical investment game. Uh, I mean, you look at second mover behavior in, um, in a hypothetical investment game as a uh, measure of positive reciprocity. Yeah? It's pretty hard to explain that to somebody on the phone in Ethiopia, say, right? So we thought that may, might be a bit too complicated, so we kicked out that item from our set, and then we run the best subset selection procedure again. Okay? And what, you, what, what I previewed, what came out, sorry, what came out, that's actually the result of that second best subset selection, where we, where we basically get rid of all these very complicated items. There are not many. Yeah, it's just a trust game that we thought was complicated. And um, we also went to a, what we call a staircase method instead of a multiple price list on the lottery choices. All right, so details are actually in the paper. Then we took this um, survey module and then we pre-tested pre that in, um, in 22 countries. And the pre-test involved that we asked respondents how they interpreted the question. Okay, and that led to some very small um, changes, wording changes predominantly. So for instance, we avoided the, um, the term like um, lottery and gambling, because in some cultures that's not acceptable. Yeah, so that's basically what we did. Um, and then we have that preference module. So, all right. 
So before I show you how preferences are distributed across the world, here's another useful um, step for many of you maybe. That is, of course, um, there are, we are not the first to you know, measure attitudes and preferences, right? So I mentioned the World Value Survey. It's the data set that has been widely used to um, get a measure of, say, trust yeah, or social capital. And so until now, people will predominantly scroll these kind of large um, global surveys if they were looking for a control variable for some preference. Okay? So if you look closely in these surveys, there is some stuff in it. And it would be nice to know how these measures that you get in these surveys compare to our validated measures. Okay? So that's actually what we did here. So we basically screened many um, surveys, including the barometers. Yeah? But since they were not always standardized across countries, in the paper we just focused on the World Value Survey and the Hofstede data. So Hofstede, for those of you who don't know, is actually a colleague from Maastricht, <laughs> I should say that. And um, but what he did is basically he, he went to IBM workers and tried to see whether there are cultural differences in people. Now you have to imagine though that IBM workers across the world are a pretty selected group, right? So it's not a representative sample. And the Hofstede measure is oftentimes used in, in, in cultural economics. So for instance, future time orientation is one of the measures and it's argued to measure time preference. So we check that, whether that is true. And so I want to share that with you. So here are some specific things. So that's, um, say, the word value survey also has something that's akin to a time preference measure. Um, that has actually been used by um, Keith Chen, for instance, when he makes the point that um, language is related to preference. What it actually is, it, it asks parents what they think is important for their kids, and then they can cross a number of items. One of them is thrift. Yeah? I find it important that my kid saves, basically. And um, they take that as a measure of, um, of time preference. Okay? You, you could take it as a proxy. Yeah? It was never in intended to be a measure of time preference, but you could use it since it's there. Similarly, the World Value um, Survey ask a question um, that is like adventure and um, um, risk taking are important um, to a person. So they describe a hypothetical person and they say um, that this is um, important to that person to have an exciting life and you have to state agreement to that. Yeah? So the idea is actually uh, not, um, um, was not designed to measure risk preference. Okay? It was not designed for that. So psychologists in the room know what this was designed for. It's, um, it's, on a, uh, by, it's um, derived from a scale by um, Norbert Schwartz and it was actually it's more related to sensation seeking. Okay. Anyhow, similarly, um, there's a World Value Survey question on, on altruism, and you, most of you know this question. Okay. And so most people can be trusted, or you can't be too careful. That's the World Value Survey question on trust. So here are the correlations now. So what you should, I think, what you can take away is um, the trust question uh, is strongly correlated with our question. Yeah. By the way. Um, we also had the World Values um, Survey question as actually the best predictor, and then we didn't use it because we already know so much about it. Okay, then um, Hofstede, um, the future orientation measure, um, correlates pretty well. Uh, the long-term orientation measure in the World Values Survey is not highly um, correlated, it's also not significant. Um, what is interesting is the, um, the World um, um, Value Survey measure that could be used as a proxy for risk preference is from this value of stimulation um, uh, scale by uh, Schwartz. That is pretty, um, you know, strongly correlated. So it captures risk preference, maybe. Okay, good. So that is just for, you, for those of you who also want to use or keep on using other surveys, right? So if you are happen to use the World Value Survey, then this question might not be such a bad proxy um, for risk um, taking. All right. So now, um, since I I want to resolve the tension a bit by showing you uh, the distribution. So this is a map of patients. So you already see that countries differ by colors. Like what do the colors mean? So blue means um, um, that you are um, above the world median. Okay? So, sorry, the world mean, I should say. And how do we calculate this? That's an important question. Okay. The way we calculate this is we take all 80,000 observations, we do not weigh by country, so all individual um, observations, we standardize the measure of patients to that population, so mean zero standard deviation one. Okay. And then we go back to the country and aggregate at the country level. 
So basically, if you see um, the dark blue, which is the US, the US is then, US population is like 0.55 standard deviations away from the global mean, so to speak. That's a lot. All right. And what you can also see is that this um, variation, so this blue seems to be related to people that are from European descent predominantly. Yeah? So there seems to be some, something that is systematic. You always see that. Okay, then there's a lot of variation. Um, maybe it's, it's, it's already late, so sometimes I, I explain the, the size because it doesn't seem that you know, France is so different from the US, right, if you look at the graph. Okay. Um, so, but let's look at risk preference here. This is a bit sluggish, okay, good. So here's, a, here's actually where we can make the point easily. So this is France, this is the US, difference in risk taking. And the, the difference between the two countries is roughly as large as the gender difference in the world population, okay? So in other words, French men are like American women. <laughs> yeah, so that's maybe a takeaway message. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. So, so also for risk, there's a lot of variation across the world. There also seem, seem to be some regional patterns. So Sub-Saharan Africa seems to be uh, very risk-taking. And um, these um, European countries are moderately risk-taking. Okay. Um, I don't go into every um, de little detail here, so for e also for, um, for um, social preferences we find there's a lot of variation across the globe. All right, altruism. So now, here I grouped that a bit for you um, to, s to basically make the point that there is some um, regional variation. Yeah? So here we group countries by, you know, you know geographic uh, grouping, which is also a bit informed by history, say, yeah? So, Western Europe versus Eastern Europe, Neo Europe, is Australia, US, of course. And you see that um, European countries and Neo Europe, um, they, they stick out in patients. You know, they're clearly much more patient than other populations across the world. But you also see in other dimensions, you see um, that, you know, for instance, Sub Saharan Africa differs in, in terms of preference endowment. Yeah. They tend to be a bit less um, pro-social, they are more willing to take risk, and they're less patient. Okay. All right. Here's also something that is not, um, probably would not be exciting to you, but um, these preferences are also correlated. They are not orthogonal. Okay, so these are um, correlations at the country level, um, but you a very similar picture you get if you do the correlation at the individual level. It's very, very similar. Okay. So that answers another question. So in economics, people always assume that risk and time preferences um, are separable. Of course, they are separable in some, you know, in some uh, models and you know, some specifications of utility functions. We all know that, but uh, empirically, it doesn't turn out, uh, you know, does not turn out to be the case that they are orthogonal. Okay. Now we look at determinants of um, of preferences. So. What we looked at um, predominantly is age, gender, and um, well, self-reported cognitive ability. You have to be very modest. This is a very crude measure of cognitive ability. So we ask people is the question, I'm good at math, and they have to state their agreement to that statement on a scale from 0 to 10. Okay? So it's a very, very crude measure. I admit to that. Um, age and gender, we have a you know, measured um, problem with much less measurement error. All right. So, um, but the reason why we're interested in, in, in age and gender, and maybe cognition, because they're plausibly exogenous to someone. Yeah, for cognition, it's less the case, we know that. But age and gender, you know, cannot really change a lot. OK, so, and these are also, for that same reason, um, the measures that people have looked at in previous work. OK, but what we want to actually establish now is the question, are they really related? So that's what would be in the regression framework easy to show. Say so people have predominantly looked at risk preference, and the common finding in, in the literature is that willingness to take risk um, declines with age. We also find that. I have to 
um, believe or trust me that uh, what I'm saying basically from that quadratic implies that there's a decline over age. Okay? It's a bit harder to see since we have a um, quadratic term here. And women are less willing to take risks than men. Yeah? There's a standard finding, but you also see that in all other preference domains there are sometimes um, these, prefer uh, these um, preferences are related to um, characteristics in a systematic manner. Um, also cognition seems to be related to these preference measures. Um, that has also been established in previous work. So, that's just the first step. That's not extremely surprising. The more exciting question is whether that pattern is, this, is true in every single country, yeah? or whether that is just an average effect. And to, to visualize this, um, we produced these graphs here. So let's look at gender. So what these graphs show you, we plot now the gender coefficient, i.e. the coefficient on the gender dummy, in the regression that I've previously shown you, when we run the regression on the country level. Okay? So every dot is an estimate of the gender effect in a given country. And then we rank them by the size, so I'm just the picture looks a bit nicer if we order them by size. Okay. Not surprisingly, if the deviation from zero is larger, it's also more likely that the effect is statistically significant at um, lower significance levels. It's also clear, right? But what what you should really take away from the graph is that in almost all countries, if anything, there is a negative gender effect, i.e. women are less willing to take risks than men. So that seems to be a pretty um, systematic effect across the globe. Yeah? So there's not idiosyncrasy here is so important. So it's probably not culturally driven. So we don't exactly understand what drives gender effects and willingness to take risks, but there are a couple of narratives. Yeah? But what is the country in the, the one country? I, I, I was actually, want, I wanted to look that up because I forgot. Um, but I can share something with you. Um, now it's published in Science two weeks ago by some of the collaborators here. Um, the gender effect tends to be smaller in countries that are more gender equal. Uh, sorry, in, uh, sorry, the gender effect tends to be smaller sorry, in countries that are that are less gender equal. Mm? And the argument is um, that in these countries um, you could basically um, um, you are not discriminated against if you, if you basically express your, your true you know, gender identity in these countries. But this is a different story. So these are probably countries that you would not have on your mind initially. Yeah? But I should also say that of course there's sampling variation. Yeah? The samples are always 1,000 people and, and it's not always uh, statistically significant. And these, these effects are also not statistically significant. Yeah? But if you compare um, say risk taking to patients then you see that here's, this is much more systematic than in patients. Yeah? Patients there doesn't seem to be a, a strong um, systematic gender effect across the globe. There are some countries where the women are more patient and some countries where men are more patient. Okay. When we turn to, um, when we turn to um, social preferences, there is clearly again a tendency for uh, women to be more pro-social and less negatively reciprocal. It's clearly seen when we look at altruism and trust. All right. So this is basically the same stuff for um, co the relation to cognitive ability. Remember that is this math question, so I don't want to overemphasize this. Yeah. But it basically again shows that um, this seems to be a pretty systematic effect. Uh, preferences are systematically relation, related to cognition. All right. So another question we could now ask, so this kind of um, was answering or alluding to the question, are there systematic differences um, among individuals within countries? Yeah, now we could also ask the question, where are these country differences come from that I've shown you? And what I um, show you here are just correlations. 
And they're all just correlations. So every correlation is probably worth a paper. Yeah? And on some of these correlations, some people are working. Yeah? Okay, so what do we do here? We basically try to get some um, measures of um, geography or um, biological conditions in countries. So that includes things like land suitability, climate, distance from, um, from the equator, and so on. I should say that, the, um, that these, two these two measures are just um, based on various um, 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 items or dimensions, and this is just a principal component. And I want to stress that th and the principal component is then coded such that it is correlated with um, GDP. Okay? So it just helps you to interpret the sign. Okay, so I, why do I say that? Um, later on, I'll show you that patients are strongly correlated with GDP, so it's not surprising that these two measures are also strongly correlated with GDP. But they do give us a bit of um, I some ideas where patients might come from. Okay, and there are various narratives around, um, and recent papers have basically said that um, patients is um, a cultural trait and you know, comes from. Um, differences in endowments that people had in their uh, habits, habitats, you know, so, so basically they adjusted to the conditions there. And one narrative could be that um, in countries away from the equator you cannot harvest so often, so you have to store food. And that instills some forward-looking behavior on people. That might be why they become more patient. Okay? So that is consistent with that, but it's not, this is by no means causal. All right. Okay. But we also see that some of these preferences are related to um, culture. Okay. And um, so I give you one example. So that measures language. That's a future time reference uh, idea. So language can force you to think um, that the future is distant or not so distant. That's the idea of future time reference in big future time reference countries, uh, languages. Sorry. Weak future time reference languages like German, you can say, um, Morgen ist es kalt. Yeah? In English, you cannot say, it is cold tomorrow. Can you? It's wrong, right? It feels weird. So in English, you're basically then forced to refer to the future in the grammatical structure. And the idea by linguists is then that a weak future time reference languages like German there the future doesn't feel so distant. It's almost like the present. Uh, so you behave more patiently. Okay. And there are some other narratives that would um, say like um, religion can shape preferences. We are working on that a bit. It's not only the share of Protestants. Um, the Jewish religion, for instance, puts a lot of emphasis on the time span. Yeah? They always have a strong reference to the past and they basically every they, 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 um, kids are basically taught that there's a long history and that this history will continue. Huh? So orientation and time is different than in some other religions maybe. Okay? They're also the most um, patient group. Okay? So there are other things that might explain that. So what we are saying here is it's not only um, biology and geography that shapes preferences but maybe also religion. And then of course religion and language and these things are not exogenous, right? To the person that is born today, it's pretty endogenous, maybe, because it's instilled by the parents. But over long periods of time, it's not exogenous, right? It's a choice. Uh, it co-evolves with other conditions. Okay, now, so there are many economists in the room, and they're probably interested in outcomes more than in these, uh, you know, narratives, where do preferences come from, yeah? Okay, so I want to say something about this as well. So we can skip this, we can just go right into behavior. Okay, so what I show you here is um, that we basically think of, we thought of, um, we thought of um, behaviors that we as economists would think are related to patients. So one is savings. Yeah? Now, you can view this exercise either as saying, oh, we document that um, patients is correlated uh, with savings, so that's what we as economists expect. expect. So patients drives, this is consistent with the story in which patients drive savings. Yeah, wouldn't surprise us, but that's what we'll document. Another way of looking at it is, and you take whatever view you want, 
this is another way of validating the measure. So if we all believe that savings is a forward-looking behavior and that it captures time preference, then the correlation with our measure basically means that our measure is a good one. Okay? So that's another way of viewing. I, it's up to you what kind of view you like to take. All right. But we document here that patience is related to accumulation decisions, like savings, um, human capital accumulation. Risk-taking is uh, related to um, risky decisions, say in the labor market, whether you become self-employed or whether you intend to become self-employed or in the health domain, whether you smoke. Okay? And these, um, again, these correlations here, they are pretty um, robust across countries. Now here you see few, uh, fewer dots than in this graph and that's just because we don't have savings measures for all these countries. Okay, but when we have them, there's a positive correlation. Same for uh, education, by and large, is a positive correlation. Risk-taking, self-employment, or intended self-employment, pretty strong effect across the globe. Okay. Very, very similar um, picture for individual behavior in a social domain. So donating money, volunteering time, helping strangers, is all related to altruism, as we would expect. Um, negative um, reciprocity, you know, um, that is, for instance, also um, correlated with voicing your opinion. That's also what you would expect. Um, yep. Yeah. So, so this is also in line with our expectations, and this is also true in every single country. So altruism and donations are related. Of course, you could say, look, donations, yeah, they is another measure of altruism. Okay, but then we would say that our measure is a pretty good one. Okay. So more exciting. I think, is, um, is basically, um, or, or at least as exciting, is now looking at country level outcomes. And we take many, many shortcuts here, okay? So you can look at this problem from various perspectives. You can think of um, second moments of the distribution, heterogeneity in the country, and that kind of stuff, okay? So this is just a very, very rough first approach of looking at it. So we only look at average preferences in a given country and relate that to outcomes. Okay, and, and that is already very informative. What we see, for instance, is that um, things that are related to entrepreneurship, like you know, scientific uh, publication of uh, scientific articles, uh, pay, um, patent applications, they tend to be related to um, risk-taking behavior. Okay? It's not systematic, but you know, we see that it's related to risk-taking behavior. Later on, I'll show you that it's related to patients, and that makes also a whole lot of sense. Um, we see that um, social outcomes, they are related to um, social preference at the country level. For instance, negative reciprocity is strongly correlated with armed conflicts. Yeah? So this is a correlation. I'm not actually saying, you know, we, we, here we don't take a stance on how causality runs. It could go either way. That's something we're also working at. Yeah? So whether conflict causes negative reciprocity or reciprocity causes conflict. Both are plausible, of course. But the key question, and that's the last question I posed today, I guess, how much time do I have? Two more minutes or so? Um, three minutes. Yeah, so I take five? <laughs> okay. uh, that's perfect. So, um, so th the key question is, is really why are some countries um, richer than other countries? Yeah, and many economists have been concerned with that question. Um, over there. Yeah. There are many theories that have been developed. Now, in a... Um, in, in an uh, um, um, accounting framework, um, development accounting framework, is it actually a no-brainer um, that um, pay related to income. Okay, why? Because in that framework, we decompose uh, differences in income to differences in production factors and technology. Now, both of these um, dimensions are the result of accumulation processes. Yeah, we accumulate physical capital, we accumulate human capital, we accumulate knowledge. And accumulation is probably driven by patience. Okay, so that's one, one thing I want to stress. But we can also... Um, so when they talk about the what explains income, they will basically just focus on these production factors. But then you can ask the question, what drives these production factors? So, so we, we kind of want to differentiate between proximate determinants, production factors, 
and you know, deeper determinants of this. Yeah, so what causes the production factors? Okay. So that's actually the question. And then there are many candidates, of course. Um, we all already alluded to geography, culture, climate, and so on. Culture is um, a big thing in the literature nowadays. And one aspect of culture could be patience. So people have argued um, that you know, patience is a cultural trait that affects this. Okay, so that's one perspective to look at it. Of course, we can also approach this uh, same problem from a completely different perspective. We can look at growth models, what, what they would give us. And in growth models, typically, uh, so take the simplest one, even the solar growth model, there, steady state income depends on production factors, but what determines the level of the production factors, ultimately? The delta. Now, that's assumed to be exogenous, and the model is closed by assuming that delta is equal um, to the time preference rate, so, but for the basic means, more patience, higher um, equilibrium income. Okay, so they, so theorists, they can assume that patience drives income. We have to prove this. It's a bit harder. All right, let's see how that works. So, and what I just said holds, of course, for many, many um, of these growth models. So, at the aggregate level, we believe that these more patient populations then uh, accumulate more of these um, factors of production. They invest more in, in R&D, so hence they have more uh, in, uh, knowledge and that drives um, growth. Yeah? At the individual level, we should observe that more patient people save more. We have already seen something about this. Uh, acquire more human capital, invest more in entrepreneurial activities and have higher income, hence. So now, I don't give you the full-blown paper. There's also another paper that we work on. In the paper, we basically also have a model that would explain some of these um, effect sizes. Yeah, so I, I just do that verbally now, but I just want to show you the graphs I and mean, this is really um, I think impressive. So if you look at the correlation between patients and GDP per capita, that's what you get. Okay, that's when we purge the data of other things that you might plausibly say drive it. So differences in the age composition, difference, yeah, all these kind of things. Education and so on. So find a very strong relationship. We can we basically have to trust me, we can I'm not making this up. We find very, very similar results if you plot growth in patients over different time horizons, like from 1800, 1900, depending, I mean the set of countries obviously changes due to data availability. Now this is a, the same thing in a regression framework. Here we just regress um, um, country GDP on country level patients. And it's really patients that's predicting it. Now, here's, a, here's actually something that, that, that might be interesting to, interesting to some of you. There's a large literature on social capital and development. Okay? And we also find that. So, if you just regress GDP on trust, you also find a significant effect. Now, if you control for a whole lot of stuff, that effect goes away. But look what happens here. Once you include patients, trust disappears. Okay? So it seems to be that patience is really the driver, which makes a whole lot of sense. But yeah, I should also note that, of course, trust is correlated um, to patience. So if you don't control for patience, then trust potentially also partly captures patience. Yeah, we, why is trust related to, to um, patience? Well, because if you trust somebody, yeah, do you think that um, that person repays in the, in the future? And, you know, it's a component of um, future orientation and trust as well, anyhow. So, then we look at um, accumulation factors, so physical capital, very strong correlation. Savings, strong correlation. Human capital, strong correlation. Okay? R&D expenditure on patients, very strong correlation. So you see that in all accumulation processes. Yeah, innovation index and so on. Here I just put that in a regression framework. So this is human capital accumulation, physical capital, knowledge accumulation. Very strong effects of patients. Not if you look at other preferences, it's just really patience, okay? Now, um, the final thing I want to say, this, this is when we do that at the regional level, so we have seven, seven out of four regions, same strong effect of patients. However, you already see that the effect size is a bit smaller at the regional level, okay? So remember that we had um, roughly two, depending on whether we use controls or not, on the country level, on the regional level, it's a bit smaller. If you look at the individual level, um, then, then it's even smaller. So then aggregation effects are roughly sevenfold. Yeah? So at the individual level, um, the effect of patient is seven times less than at the aggregate level. And that implies very strong aggregation effect or measurement error. In the paper, we exclude measurement error. So it's really um, um, 
aggregation effect. One, one way to, to um, think about it is if you, as a patient person, live in a patient country, yeah, then it's much easier even for you to save. Yeah? And even an impatient person in their country profits from behavior of others. Because income is higher. Yeah? Think about um, um, the fraction of educated people is higher. If you're impatient, you're not educated, but um, you're more scarce. So your wages would also increase. Right? And so it, we, then in this paper, we basically um, write up various versions of models, um, in, in even the simplest one. Um, when we simulate this with um, you know, parameters that we get from the literature, we would exactly generate this uh, aggregation effect. So we are pretty convinced that um, patience is a key driver of income and growth. Now, let me um, conclude here because I think I'm out of time. So I just um, leave that up while I'm talking. So for th so those of you, you know, we just want to s still don't, don't know what to do with the data set because it's available and invite every one of you to work with it. Yeah, there's lots we can learn, and we will certainly not write many papers on this. Um, but let me um, um, conclude by saying um, um, that my so oftentimes I get the question if it's patience and the pa time it's a, it's a preference. There's nothing we can do about you know changing income inequality across the world, right? That's not our view here. Okay, and that brings me back to what I said in the beginning. So what we measure here is patient behavior, whether people think they behave patiently or whether they behave patiently in that hypothetical choice experiment. And that might be shaped by many things, like institutions, yeah, if you live in a country without property rights, or if you live in a country when you live, don't, don't know whether you're still alive next year, say low life expectancy, which is also determined by um, institutions, by the health system, and so on. Yeah? Then, then your patient behavior is less, even though your latent time preference parameter might be the same. Yeah? So that is like the way that I like to think about this. Okay? So there is scope for institutions to come in to basically change patient behavior. So sometimes you don't have to change the latent preference parameter, and that's a kind of a misunderstanding. Yeah? But what we measure is actually um, risk-taking behavior, patient behavior. Okay? And that is certainly shaped by many, many other things. Final sentence on that, there's a very, very strong correlation to make that point between patient behavior or, or patient's measure and life expectancy, both across countries and within countries. Yeah? Both at the core level, for which we have objective life tables, and also um, from another data set, that's a pretest in the ZERP, um, f at the individual level. So people who think that they live longer also report that they're more patient. Okay, so let me stop here. Thanks a lot.